uh, this is the Kubernetes architecture. A working Kubernetes deployment is called a Kubernetes cluster. You see all of this is a Kubernetes cluster. Even this is part of a Kubernetes cluster. Everything is part of a Kubernetes cluster. Now a Kubernetes, now first of all, Kubernetes is also called K8s. I will be using K8 somewhere basically between the K and S. There are eight uh, characters and that's where it's called K8s. Uh, but, but you can interchangeably reason like it's K8s or Kubernetes or whatever it is, right? Now, Kubernetes cluster have two parts. One is the control pane. The control pane is also called a master node sometimes, but typically these days they don't use the master slave terminology. So it's, it's a control pane. And then you have a set of compute machine on nodes. This compute machine on nodes can be one, a minimum one is required to run a Kubernetes cluster, or there can be hundreds or thousands of Kubernetes nodes. Typically, you don't want to use Kubernetes on a single node, right? There's no point. You can just run containers directly on that machine. But when you have hundreds and thousands of nodes, you go into Kubernetes kind of orchestration uh, framework. Now, Kubernetes can run on any infrastructure. It can be a physical infrastructure. It can be a virtual machines. It can be a private network, public network, or an hybrid cloud, or any devices that can run Kubernetes process. It can be even edge devices. There are a lot of edge devices that comes with Kubernetes uh, uh, runtime. Right. So uh, the underlying infrastructure can be anything. So basically, in this case, when I say like hybrid, it can be your public cloud. What you do is you develop your application on premise and then ship it to the cloud. It can be an bare metal Amazon EC2 instance where you create your own Kubernetes cluster, or it can be a cloud managed Kubernetes cluster like uh, Google GKE or Amazon EKS or others. Right. So it can be anything. And that's the beauty of Dockers and Kubernetes. Right. You develop, you can run it anywhere. So that's why the underlying infrastructure, it can be any underlying infrastructure that supports Kubernetes. Now, control plane coming to control plane. Control plane is nothing but a collection of process that control Kubernetes nodes. So this is a collection of process. You can see like multiple process within that. that this controls the Kubernetes node control plane holds data about the cluster state and configuration. It handles the important work of making sure your container are running in sufficient numbers with the necessary resources. So when you say your application, I want three copies for your application. The control plane makes sure there's always three copies. Always remember any node can go down at any point in time. So the containers that is executing the node can also go down. But your control plane will make sure that you have sufficient number of instances running by restarting the particular container on a different node altogether. So that's why the control plane, it's kind of a master node that monitors the entire uh, cluster. Now, uh, there can be one control plane or there can be a multiple control plane uh, processes, uh, multiple instance of control plane processes, depending on you want high availability or not. And typically in an enterprise cluster, you may want high availability. Now a control plane has multiple process. You have like API server, scheduler, you have the Kubernetes control manager. Now API server, the first one is kind of the Kubernetes API and it's the entry point into your Kubernetes cluster. It handles your internal and external request. Now the API calls can be via a Kubernetes API or if you're familiar with Kubernetes, you will be using the kubectl command line. So whenever you ask an application instruct to deploy uh, an instance of your application, the first, uh, first point your interface will be your control plane and the Kube API server. Now kubectl, which we'll see as we go into the demo, is the command line configuration tool for Kubernetes. Right? The next is the kube scheduler. Now what the kube scheduler does is it schedule pods but it's the simplest unit in your Kubernetes that can run one or more containers. So your pod is nothing but a container. Container is nothing but your software application. A pod can run one or more container together. I will cover in detail as we go into that, why one or more containers. But uh, the Kubernetes scheduler is basically it schedule pods on compute node. It kind of determines the right node to assign containers and it also monitors the cluster health. Now, some application that you have, say you have a TensorFlow application. A TensorFlow application basically needs GPU. 
So you can also create node labels telling these are my GPU nodes. And when you assign a, when, when you kind of deploy your application, you can tell, I want to run this on a GPU node. The cube scheduler takes care of scheduling that particular container based on the node label on a particular set of nodes. It will also make sure that not all application is running on one single node. It is distributed across node based on your resource consumption and multiple other factors. That's where the cube scheduler uh, comes into play. Now the cube control manager takes care of actually running the cluster. The controller consults the scheduler along with the scheduler and make sure the correct number of pod is running and acts on it if not. So if I say I want like 10 instance of my uh, flask application run, it makes sure that all the 10 application is running. The controller also takes care, connects your services. The services are external uh, requests that you make to the pods. So basically say like it's a, a Kubernetes is like a shared environment. You can have multiple containers running, multiple applications running. One application can be a shopping application. The other application can be an payment application. So what basically this particular cube control manager does it when you as a user call an API that says like I want to go to the shopping container. Then it will it will make sure it routes to the right shopping containers. It will uh, if you talk about payment container talk right route to the right payment containers. Then the other one is etcd right or etcd now. It, this is nothing but a database, right? It's a it's a fault tolerant distributed key value store that contains all the config, uh, configuration data of your cluster and also the state of the cluster. So anything you do is maintained in the HCD uh, database. It's a key value uh, store, right? Now, now the next part is the compute machine. The compute machines are nothing but a bunch of nodes together. The nodes are nothing but servers or edge devices that can run a Kubernetes uh, process. That's what your compute machines are. Now the pods that we talk about are scheduled and orchestrated to run on nodes. You can add and remove node to cluster as required. To me, today you may start small, but as the company grows, you may have a lot of applications coming in. So you can add clusters as you require and you can remove clusters if you don't want it. Think about companies that you're using Kubernetes, right? It can be Amazon, Reddit, Airbnb, Tinder, Pinterest, Google, all of them use uh, like Kubernetes today. And they run around thousands of nodes, like some even run uh, very high thousands of nodes. And they do like thousands of deployments a day. The, now Kubernetes is also a way of easily packaging your application, doing champion challenger deployment, there are a lot of things you can do. They do literally do thousands of deployments a day as well. And the flexibility comes in how Kubernetes orchestrated, Kubernetes scales it, and the Kubernetes provided functionality of champion challenger deployment or other deployment methodologies, right? Now, coming to the main, the pod. Now, I said pod is the simplest unit in Kubernetes, right? It represents a single instance of application. So when we talk about a pod, one pod is one application. So if I have an application, I just create a pod out of it. Now, I don't want two different applications sharing the same pod. Typically, that's not the right architecture. Even though you can do it, you don't want to do it, right? That's why typically this comes into the microservice architecture uh, that we talk about, right? Now, a pod can also have multiple containers. Now think about a Flask application. If you are running a Flask application that terminates a HTTP request and you want to add SSL to it, you want to do HTTPS termination, you can also put a Nginx container into the pod followed by the actual application container. So any request that comes in can hit your Nginx container, which takes a HTTPS request and then routes it to an HTTP connection. That's your Flask application. You can do that as well. You can have your keys and everything created for security on the Nginx container. So a pod can have one or more containers. A typical architecture is basically you will have one container within a pod in most cases, but there can be cases where you can have multiple containers as well. Right. So there is nothing that it's not the best. Uh, the advantage of bundling all your containers within the pod is because the is ours. This pods within this container within a pod, they share same IP address, same host name and other resources. So what happens when you deploy a pod? You don't know where your containers will it or where your pods will it. The Kubernetes control plane can schedule it anywhere. You will not have the IP address.
Now, if you want to communicate the Nginx to your Flask application, if you bundle it within a pod, they are in the same IP address. So you can just use localhost. But they all share the same IP address, IPC, host name, and other resources as well. That's the advantage of having multiple containers within a pod. Right. Finally, like you also have a container runtime. This container runtime is nothing but it can be a Docker, it can be a CRIO, it can be a Rocket. This container runtime, as I said, this nothing but takes a container image and converts it into a container that is accessible. A container image is nothing but a static file over here. Now, container registry. This container registry can be an internal or external container registry. If you are aware of like Docker Hub, Right. So Docker Hub is like a container registry and every cloud provider also has a container registry. So your container registry is basically storing all your static information about your container or what needs to go into the container. What kind of what kind of like uh, uh, dependencies that goes into a container. Right. That's what the container registry is about. And typically you will have a private container registry when you are within an organization or you can have a public repository like Docker Hub or something like that. Or in cloud, you can uh, have like in Google Cloud, they have their own container registry. You can show store your data over there. Now, the other important process in the computer compute machine is kubelet. Right now, this each node that we see over here, that can be hundreds of nodes or thousands of nodes. Each node contains a kubelet and kubelet is nothing but a tiny application that communicates with the control pane. The kubelet like makes sure that containers are running. Uh, basically, uh, the if, in case if something goes down, the kubelet will make sure that, okay, the containers are up and running. And if not, it will inspect the control plane to schedule it on a different node altogether. So it is also monitoring your container within that node. Now, also when a control plane uh, needs something to do on an individual nodes, they kind of communicate with the kubelet and ask them to execute those commands. So that's where kubelet is, uh, kubelet is coming into play. The final one is kube proxy. Now you are Kubernetes cluster. Now, whatever you want to do in the Kubernetes cluster, you can do it from externally. You can log in within the Kubernetes cluster. But sometimes the Kubernetes cluster might need access to external services. Say your application that is calling an uh, external sub, uh, external service provided by a vendor or your partner or your customer or anyone, right? Kube proxy helps care of all this networking uh, component of it, right? It handles the network communication both inside and outside of the cluster. Now, one important component in the data space is the persistent storage. See, the way the cluster is, the pods are expected to die anytime. Like that's how you define, that's how you design your architecture. Uh, any node can go. These are all commercial or bare metal machines. It can go anytime. A power can go off. A, a data center can go down. Anything can happen. So if you store any information within the pod or a container, any data, it, it, it is available only for the life of the container. If something goes off, all the data is gone. And you don't want that to happen, right? Now, your persistent storage is what you, you how you share your data. And typically in the data application, a lot of times you will use persistent storage. It can also connect, your pods can as well connect to your existing databases and storages and everything, right? It can connect to your SQL server. It can connect to your other databases from the application. But there are multiple benefits of persistent storage. I will talk as we go into the detail of it. One common benefit is most of the models that we deal with Right, uh, like uh, if you take a speech to text model or vision model, the, the model size is pretty big. Now you can load all the models within the container, the container image size which becomes very big. It sometimes even go to 10 GB or 20 GB. Now, the more bigger the image size is, the more time it takes to load the containers. So what you can do is you can actually keep your models and everything in the persistent storage. And when the container starts, you can mount this particular persistent storage into your pod definition and then load the model. You can pin it into memory. That is one option. The second option is you want to store the state. Sometimes like when your pod is scheduled, your pod instance can be scheduled in 10 different nodes and you want to share some data between these 10 different nodes. You can use persistent storage or databases for that as well. So that's where the persistent storage 
uh, it comes into play. A persistent storage basically allows Kubernetes to manage the application data that is attached to the cluster. And as I said, the persistent volume are specific to the cluster rather than a pod. So other, other particular pods can be accessible. There can be security framework that can be set. Uh, and it outlive the life of a pod. So anything that goes down the pod, the data you have written in the pod is gone when a pod goes down or a container goes down, but persistent volume, uh, volume the data stays. So this is like overall architecture of Kubernetes. Right?